A YouTube channel called Real Reporter did a story on NATO vehicles that were put out on display after being captured in Ukraine. And I got a flood of emails asking me to review the video and see if it was true or see if it was propaganda. One person even said it's a new channel with Russian content but an American reporter. And this is going to become important later. And I was actually a little reluctant to do that. I don't take food out of the mouths of other YouTubers unless what they're doing is so egregious that I have to say something. The Tucker Carlson, Colonel McGregor interview is one example where I just couldn't remain silent. So I watched the video from a reporter, and I noticed a few things that I do want to point out. And I'm going to start by saying that I didn't see anything that was blatantly, horribly untrue. It wasn't the Colonel McGregor interview. But there were some exaggerations and some odd assertions and things that just needed more context. So to keep this within fair use, I'm only going to show the selected clips. If you want to see the whole video, you can go watch it below. Now, Real Reporter is a channel run by Konstantin Roskov, who is a former journalist for Russia Today. In fact, you can see him cover Russia's tank biathlon for Russia Today right here. Now, he popped up in 2020 when he was detained in the U.S. as he tried to enter the United States to cover U.S. elections in October of 2020. Now, it seems like someone has gone to great lengths to keep Konstantin Roskov's last name a secret because you can't find his name on YouTube. In fact, he even did an interview with the American Marketing Association of New York. They didn't use his last name and they turned comments off, which is kind of interesting. Now, the channel was started in March of 2022, so the timing for Real Reporter's channel is certainly interesting since the invasion of Ukraine was in February of 2022. So this channel could be a Russian PSYOP since you have a pretty normal looking and even attractive Western guy who speaks English pretty well. This could be an effort to trick people into thinking that he is a Westerner. Although he does have a video where he explains that he was born in Russia and worked for RT. I'll have a link to that below. But it's kind of weird they have to dig so hard just to find this guy's last name. Now before I get started with the actual review, give me 60 seconds to pay the bills here. I'm speaking at the 2024 Disaster and Emergency Response Convention in Australia this summer. And whenever I travel, I always bring along some protection. You guessed it, PIA VPN. Click the link in the description below and get PIA VPN for 83% off plus four months free. Now I want to show you something. So you might meet some girl and you go back to her place and you know, her Wi-Fi looks clean, but you can't tell if a girl's Wi-Fi has a virus just by looking at it and you have no idea how many guys have connected to her hotspot before. And that's where PIA VPN comes in. PIA VPN creates a tunnel between your computer and the public internet that hackers and rogue government agents can't penetrate. With just a couple of clicks, you can select servers in multiple locations. It even allows you to change your location so that you can do things like watch a Netflix library from a foreign country that's restricted in your country. So when I'm in Australia, I'll be able to watch all the Netflix content I enjoy at home. If you don't have PIA VPN, you are sticking your Wi-Fi antenna God knows where. So click the link in the description below or go to PAAVPN.com slash Macbeth to get 83% off plus four months free. Now let's get back to the video. Now Real Reporter covers Russian life, like a family that immigrated to Russia from Canada or how Western brands are still found on store shelves. But the video of interest to my viewers was about a static display of NATO vehicles that were captured in Ukraine and displayed in Moscow. Now, the first interesting thing about this video is that it doesn't have any ads. So I don't know if this video was demonetized by YouTube or the video was uploaded without ads. In fact, not a single video I clicked on is running with ads enabled. And this is kind of weird. And if it was uploaded without ads, it kind of begs the question, is this person making money off Patreon or are there alternate types of funding? So let's actually look at the video. It starts with this M1 Abrams that was almost definitely hit by a mine on the left track. And I said it because it's missing a fender and it's thrown the track. Now, I would not put it past the Russians to damage the vehicle further, either accidentally during the recovery process, which happens, or intentionally to make the vehicle look more wrecked, which, believe it or not, we're actually going to see later. Now, one funny thing about destroyed tanks, if you ever encounter a destroyed tank, 
Don't touch it. Don't climb on it. Don't climb around it. Don't climb in it unless you absolutely have to perform a rescue of someone who's trapped inside that vehicle. There are all sorts of chemicals and heavy metals that have been released into the air during that process of burning. You do not want to breathe that in. You do not want to get that on your skin. Don't touch the... Oh, oh, okay. Wow, he really did that. All right, well, hopefully he won't touch the tank again. He's touching the tank again. And now he's touching his face. All right. So don't, don't, uh, don't do that. I'm surprised the Russians let him climb up on the tank uh, in the first place, but I guess they really don't care about their people. So uh, then uh, Real Reporter speaks with a Russian soldier who's wearing a ribbon of St. George. This is a Russian ribbon that was made famous during World War II and has recently turned into a symbol of the war in Ukraine. Uh, this Russian soldier mentions that the Abrams took several inches to the side of the turret and what he calls the running gear, which I think he means the track. But, I mean, maybe it happened that way, maybe it didn't. I'm still going with a mine strike, which is a pretty big killer of tanks. Uh, it's also possible that the hole in the turret was made afterwards by a Russian who was curious about the penetration capabilities of a weapon system. Um, so maybe it happened like that, maybe it didn't. Then he mentions taking down one of the most advanced pieces of American hardware. They come here, they see with their own eyes that their military can indeed take down one of the most advanced pieces of American hardware. That's not really correct. Let me give a quick history of the Abrams. The original M1 Abrams debuted in 1980, but the main gun, a 105 millimeter, was a little anemic. By 1986, we had created the M1A1, which had a 120 millimeter gun. This was the tank that served in the first Gulf War. Then we created the M1A2, which debuted in 1992. This contained improved fire control, a commander's independent thermal viewer, and other enhancements. Then we created the M1A2 SEP, or System Enhancement Package, that added digital maps. Then we created the M1A2 SEP V2, which added a remote weapon station. Today, we're up to the M1A2 SEP V3, some of which have the Trophy Active Protection System on them, which is sort of like an Iron Dome system for tanks. So, technically, the tanks that we gave to Ukraine are the same tanks that fought in the first Gulf War, the M1A1. Now, imagine a gaming PC from 1991. 486, 2 megabytes of RAM, VGA monochrome monitor, maybe a color monitor, a choice of a 1.2 megabyte floppy disk, or maybe a 1.44 megabyte floppy drive and a 200 megabyte internal hard disk. That's basically what we sent to Ukraine, a 1990s era gaming PC. So we didn't send our best. We sent something 32 years old. Also note that we sent 31 Abrams and maybe five Abrams were destroyed. So if the tanks got there in September of 2023, and now it's May of 2024, we're losing on average 0.71 Abrams per month. At this attrition rate, Ukraine will run out of Abrams in three years. Then something interesting happens. Listen to this dialogue. The captured model is an M88 armored recovery vehicle based on the older American M48 Patton tank. General Patton, an iconic American commander from World War II, lent his name to M48. You notice how he said, lend his name to M48? Lent his name to M48. And English speakers would have said, lent his name to the M48 or lended his name to the M48. There are no definite or indefinite articles in the Russian language, and, and that would be a, an, the. The sense of articles is kind of conveyed by the context in a lot of Slavic languages. A cat in Russian, like a, like a female cat, is koshka, not like a koshka. So for Russians, articles are the Lego bricks on the floor of the English language. And Konstantin Roskov uses the article the most of the time, but the mask kind of slipped here. So if there is some kind of subterfuge going on with whether he's trying to make people think that he's a Westerner in Russia, this is where it fails. But again, if he's trying to fool people into thinking he's Western, why does he have a video where he explains who he is? And if he's being honest about himself, where's his last name? So, I just don't know. I, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of Russia that isn't true, and, and there's some stuff that is true, and who knows what's true anymore. 
But I wanted to be darn sure, so I contacted Katya Shanhelia, a producer at Kordosky Live and the Dossier Center, uh, which is a Russian opposition news channel in Lithuania. And here's what she said about Konstantin Roskov's accent that was pretty interesting. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Well, all Slavic languages may be somewhat similar, but are different enough. Let's examine Real Reporter's video, assuming that he's likely a native speaker of Russian. As Ryan explained earlier, articles don't exist in Russian. Most of the time, there is enough context that allows you to understand if you're discussing a specific cat or cats in general. Let's have Margot help us out. You are so heavy. If I convince you with this. So, say you want to say that this cat is lovely. In English, you would just say, this is a lovely cat. In Russian, articles are not needed. You simply see the cat or koshka, and it's right here in front of you. And you can just say, Kaka krasivaya koshka. English sometimes can match with Russian. Just think about it. Unless you're saying that a specific group of cats is lovely, you would simply say, well, cats are lovely. Koshki prekrasne. No articles are needed. But what happens if someone uses their articles correctly? What are some of the other signs that someone is a native Russian speaker? Notice in his video, there's a lot of vowel reduction, which often results in different vowels sounding as just eh. What about the other signs? Well, Russian has no interdentals, so there are difficulties with sounds like th, that, think, will sound more like sat, sink, or even fink, depending on the preference of the speaker. The letter W is often also a problem. What will suddenly turn into vat or whatever? And finally, certain words can just end up sounding similar because we oftentimes blend our vowels. So bed, bad, bat, and bet will just sound pretty much like the similar word. Keep in mind, however, that these explanations are not definitive. How a native speaker will pronounce things depends on how many uh, how, how they learned their language, what kind of English they learned. Is it American, British, or Australian? Additionally, age and one's, she's protesting, age and one's learning environment can radically shape whether they will sound native or like your typical bad Ruski character from a movie filmed during the Cold War. That's all from me. Back to you, Ryan. Well, thank you, Katya. I appreciate that. Now, back to this particular video. The good news is that I've been watching this video and he hasn't touched it on her. Oh, for Pete's sake. All right, so, so this one is a German leopard, and what's interesting here is that he actually shows the barrel of the German leopard being bent downwards. And it's kind of interesting that he would show Russia's staging and altering the state of the equipment, because what else might have been altered? And he talks about this captured German martyr, which got stuck in the mud, and he references the rubber pad on the tracks. These are usually added uh, to protect asphalt roads uh, during like military parades and stuff like this. So not exactly what you'd want in a muddy combat zone. Okay, that part is kind of true. A lot of tanks in Europe have these rubber pads because when you move around in Europe, if you have steel tracks without those rubber pads, they will tear up the road. And the pads also help reduce noise and vibration. Russian tanks don't tend to use rubber pad tracks except for parades because all steel track shoes are cheap. And if you don't move your tanks very much, except for a few training exercises in the dirt every year, then you can kind of stick with steel. But the reporter asks a Russian soldier why the pads are not removed. And the Russian soldier says, it's our belief that Ukrainians didn't have the time. You know what's funny is I was mech infantry for a couple of years, although mainly an anti-armor guy. I don't ever remember the drivers ever taking the track pads off. Replacing track pads is long, hard, back-breaking work. There's 78 shoes per M1 track and two pads per shoe, so that's 156 pads per track. This is gonna take some time. I actually reached out to the chieftain himself, Nicholas Moran, who has forgotten more about armor than I will ever know. And he said, Well, Ryan, you're in luck because you messaged me the question just as I happened to be visiting the Ontario Regiment Museum, which, if you're curious, is about now east of Toronto. And so I can answer the question with the aid of a few props, such as a T-72, which, as you can see, this one has the traditional Russian-Soviet style all-steel track with a, an extremely aggressive type of uh, track shape. Now, you'll note, of course, that with just the steel strips contacting the ground, 
you're kind of lacking a little bit in traction when the surface is hard. So you will have seen videos of Russian tanks skidding around on roads, tarmac, concrete, things like that. Now compare it with a Western type vehicle. And what we have here is a World War II era M3 light. With the track pads, you can see our simple solid rubber track pads. Now, to, the reason they're there is A, it reduces vibration, which thus increases the surface life of pretty much the entire rest of the vehicle. And B, it gives you more traction on hard surfaces that the steel can't bite into, such as roads, concrete, asphalt, tar mechanical. But one thing the Russian guy did get right is, well, these track pads have absolutely zero grip. Well, the Americans thought of that. So eventually, uh, let's say on this M24, or particularly this M4 medium, you'll see that they've molded a very aggressive pattern onto the rubber pads. The catch. The rubber pads will wear out faster than the tracks wear out. Solution. You make replaceable track pads, such as on the Chieftain or on a Leopard. Now the idea of you pull out one of these track pads and then you have grip isn't really going to work because what you've got is a small little, uh, maybe it's about an inch at best deep piece of, tra uh, of uh, grip of steel. But what is actually going to happen, and I can demonstrate this on a T-34 that they haven't cleaned the tracks on, is that the mud will pack in and you will lose the grip that you're supposed to have. So example here, this T-34 track, you can see the shape of the metal that is supposed to come out here, and it's supposed to be most of an inch deep. Well, it's not, you just got hard packed mud. So you won't actually gain very much traction if all you do is pull the track pads. So what if you do need more traction on a Western vehicle? Well, they thought of that. And on modern vehicles such as the M1, the M60 had it as well in one of the track types. And yes, Leopard and Martyr and so on. You have these grazers. Also found on this M, uh, correction, on this Lynx. M113 and a half, it was usually called. What you'll do is you'll take one of these and place it instead of one of these track pads. So knock out ooh, every tenth link or so, pull out one of these, put on the X grazer, and that will give you your additional traction that you need when you really need to bite into something, like on ice. So that's how you do it. So maybe the Russian soldier didn't know that we don't remove our pads. That soldier should probably watch the Chieftain's channel, which you can find below. All right, by now, we've almost made it to the end of the video, and Konstantin Roskov hasn't... Yep, yep, he did it again. <clears throat> Thank God this guy is an in Tijuana. All right, look, the, the, the video ends with a guy talking about F-16s, and since learning how to fly an American jet is hard, this Russian man on the street thinks that the job will be done by American and British contractors. Well, it probably won't be British contractors because the UK doesn't fly the F-16, but it isn't unreasonable that contractors who fly for countries that do fly the F-16 could join the Ukrainian International Legion. Although pilots are a dime a dozen, the real people that Ukraine needs don't fly the F-16, they maintain them. These are the people that keep the jets in the air. The pilots just go up and break them. So, a couple of closing thoughts here. There have been some people who said, what if Russia can reverse engineer these vehicles and find their weak points? And I'm kind of reminded of this cartoon called Regular Show, which is about two slackers who worked at a park. And in this one episode, they find out their park intern is a Russian spy who is there to steal American park technology. Russian park technology is decades behind the rest of the world. In the world's theater, we are a laughing stock. What made American parks so good? He couldn't crack it. And it's like, there's nothing special here. Russia is totally capable of building a modern tank in theory, but can they pay for it? And can they build many of them? The T-14 Armada, which is their first new tank in years, is estimated to cost between $5 million and $9 million a pop. And it doesn't even work. Although, look, all new equipment has teething problems. Uh, 
I think maybe they built eight T-14s, and the U.S. Army wants a fleet of about 2,100 M1A2 SEP V3s, and so far the U.S. Army has built about 10,000 M1 platforms, although some have been sold to foreign countries like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Australia, and Poland. As for finding the weak spot, this isn't a video game. This isn't Generation Zero, where you're trying to shoot the weak spot of some walking tank. For the most part, the weak spots in tanks are all the same. Front armor is the strongest, side armor is weaker, rear, belly, and top are weakest. You don't need to evaluate a tank to know that. It's true for pretty much every tank. Now, I'm sure the Russians would want to look at one. I mean, I would be curious, but they're probably not going to learn anything new from a 30-year-old tank. And I also want to mention an article from April of 2022 by Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling who claimed that he traveled to Russia for an exchange program called the Partnership for Peace. And while there, he saw a secret field museum that had tanks from all armies in the world, including several from the United States. The Russians had somehow managed to obtain an M1 Abrams tank, probably from one of their allies in the Middle East. And we all believe the reason they allowed us into this facility was to show us they had our most modern armor. So the story happened in 1994. And I know that Egypt got the M1 tank in 1991, I believe, so it's not unreasonable that this could have happened. It could have also been a Viz mod or visual modification. You know that movie Courage Under Fire? They used old Centurion tanks with visual modifications to stand in for the M1 tank. Although you can't hide the fact that the Viz mod for the movie only has six road wheels and the M1 tank has seven. And it's a movie. But it's possible the Russians may have set up sort of a Potamkin village to make Americans think they had one of their tanks. And another thing, Russia has to kind of tread lightly with this because this isn't the propaganda when they think it is. Either they say, we have your tank and ours just as good. And now you admit that you're at parity or you brag that we have your tank and we're going to learn from it. But if you do that, you've just admitted inferiority. So just by kind of showing this video, it kind of can go either way here. So what does this all mean? Well, this is definitely a propaganda channel, but it's soft propaganda. In some ways, it's kind of what makes it so dangerous. It's the equivalent of a stripper telling you that she likes your shirt. She doesn't really like your shirt, even though you think it's a reasonable compliment. She just wants something. And what Russia wants you to think is that Russia is in such a bad place. Now, this might actually be true for the average citizen in Russia, but for the average Ukrainian living under Russian occupation, not so much. Hey, if you want to support the channel, head on over to Bunker Branding, get yourself a Ryan Macbeth t-shirt, or grab a Ryan Macbeth in-action figure from the Knife Hand Company. It even comes with its own trading card. And thank you guys so much for watching. It's me, Captain Bannon of the documentary Team Yankee. When I'm not kicking commie butts, I'm wearing t-shirts from Ryan Macbeth available at Bunker Branding, Knife Hands, High Mars, Landmines, Patriot, and even my favorite, the Tow Missile. Mushna, we want t-shirt too. Take a hike, commie. <coughs> so come on down to Bunker Branding and take a stand for what's really important about America, capitalism.